All right, welcome once again to White Lotus of Light conversational series. I'm here with uh, the wonderful and amazing uh, Philip Jimenez. Um, and today we have a very, uh, a very interesting, uh, controversial at times subject um, that traces through quite literally thousands of years of history. And that is uh, the subject of who truly runs the world? Who pulls the strings? I think uh, many of my viewers uh, more than likely are aware that the people who hold various titles such as president or what have you are not who runs the world. And I would say that my viewers are even quite a bit more savvy than that and understand that uh, there's complex um, power players behind the scenes. Uh, if you're a regular watcher of my channel, then you know that I have uh, from a spiritual point of view, uh, come to the conclusion that the deity that the people who run the world is Moloch. And who are the people who run the world? It appears to me and to uh, my guest, Philip, that it is a group known as the Venetian Black Nobility. Um, I will dive into that here more in a second, but I want to just introduce Philip. Philip is, um, and, and now you're an international law professor, is that correct? No, I'm kind of like uh, international law, uh, like an entrepreneur. I started a, okay. a program here in Mongolia that we've had to put on hold because of COVID. But my my hope and my dream is to create a new center, new capital, intellectual capital for international law. Okay. In in uh, Lombata, here is in the capital of Mongolia. And so, and, and Philip, but you, t you teach at a university, do you not? I teach English. I do different things. I have an environmental okay. NGO. I do some uh, advising for some uh, people in, in government occasionally. Mm -hmm. But, my, but this, these are all kinds of, uh, a kind of a way of embedding myself and embracing the society around me in hopes of sort of paving the way to being able to do what it is I really came here to do, which has turned out to be more difficult than I expected. And as we will see, it is connected with uh, the black nobility and these, and these families. So I come at this, I suppose, more, more in terms of a, of a, a very, for me, a very practical, pragmatic approach. I'm, I can't say that I'm an expert or that I'm a researcher. I mm -hmm. have certain practical goals, and this research to me is incredibly important in terms of getting, uh, getting to where I, I need to be in terms of understanding mm -hmm. what's really going on. If you don't understand what's really going on, how are you going to change anything? Right. Uh, so, and, so. I, I will say, viewers, uh, Philip is an absolutely brilliant man, and he's underselling his uh, his brilliance here a little bit. <laughs> um, and he'll say that yeah, I'm overselling you. it, and somewhere in between the two, probably the truth lies, uh, which is um, kind of a, a funny thing because the subject matter today, as uh, Philip and I have discovered um, through our investigations over the years, and even just recently, uh, Philip and I both kind of had our mind blown the past few days as we were starting to d delve into the subject, um, just how deep it is. And so the Venetian Black nobility, who are they? I'm just going to real quick share um, this, this meme that's actually quite, uh, quite on point and interesting. And so let's pop this open. So it says the 13 families you think rule the world. Uh, it's often said that there's 13 bloodlines that rule the, rule the world. And people think it's the Astor bloodline, the Bundy, the Collins, the DuPonts, I'm sure you've heard of, the Freemans, the Kennedys, I'm sure you've heard of, the Lee bloodline uh, in Asia, uh, the Anassis, Reynolds, Rockefeller, Rothschild, Russell, and Van Duyn. The, um, that's, I believe, the, the 13 that Fritz Springmeier uh, an old school Christian conspiracy theorist pretty famously brought this list forward. And I would argue that these families are the uh, 
front people for uh, the actual families who run the world, which are the Borgia bloodline, the Breakspear bloodline, the Somalgia bloodline, the Orsini bloodline, the Conti bloodline, the Chigi bloodline, the Colonna bloodline, the Farnes bloodline, the Medici bloodline, the uh, Gaetani bloodline, and I'm probably butchering these, uh, mi dispiace, no parlo italiano. I know to say I don't speak Italian in Italian. Yeah. Uh, the Pamphili bloodline, uh, the Esti bloodline, and the Aldo Brandini bloodline. And the Pallavicini, um, Massimo. Yes. And there's Habsburg. Habsburg, yes. The Habsburg, yes, which is hu Hanover. huge. And well, and actually, uh, 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 Philip has a personal tie to the uh, a, a Habsburg uh, that we'll get into at some point. Th that's just barely scratching the surface um, of the, the, those are the major houses, but they all have a lot of offshoots and they've all intermarried over the centuries and even millennia into various bloodlines. Another very famous one is Saxe Coburg Gotha, and people might go, Saxe Coburg Gotha, I've never heard of it. Oh, but you have. See, the thing is, Saxe Coburg Gotha is now known as the House of Windsor. Because during World War I, when the English were fighting the Germans, Saxe Coburg Gotha, being a German branch of the Black nobility, that was uh, not real good for public relations in 1914. So uh, they changed their name to the House of Windsor. So that, of course, is the Queen of England and her family. So um, the, there's also the House of Orange is hugely important. Um, and I mean, and, and there's, there's many of them. And, and I mean, it's uh, once you start to look into the heredity of various blue blood uh, bloodlines, right? The nobility of Europe, they are super incestuous, sometimes literally. <laughs> and um, th they've all intermarried each other for centuries and millennia. But I think one of the best ways to define the black nobility is they're sometimes called the papal bloodlines. And what's meant by that is these families had a near virtual stranglehold on the papacy from its genesis uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire into its really formative years into about the 14 or 1500s, they were still producing popes and cardinals all the time, these families. And so one of the things we want to talk about today is uh, Philip and I want to strangely both verify and debunk a commonly held belief, uh, which again, this goes back to that intermingling and incestuous nature. Um, one of the things I see very commonly um, that's concerning for me is uh, my son is, um, his grandfather was Jewish. My ex-wife, who I love dearly, her father's Jewish. Um, and uh, her, her current partner, whom I adore, is like fully Jewish. His mother's Jewish. Technically, my ex-wife and son wouldn't be from an Orthodox point of view. But um, the point is, is that I have a lot of personal investiture in uh, people that I adore who are of Jewish descent. Now, why, why am I bringing up uh, Jewishness? It's because there is, there's been a, a sudden surge in awareness around something that's colloquial called quite often now, which is kind of coded, uh, the Khazarian Mafia. And we're going, to, we're going to touch a bit into the history of the empire or the Khanate, actually, of Khazaria. Uh, because they're uh, Turkic people, actually, who were in between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. And I'm going to throw up another um, uh, useful image here. Here's one of the, uh, this is the Khazar uh, uh, Khanate. Um, it's basically here between um, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea region. Whoops, excuse me here. And it's into, interestingly enough, modern day Ukraine. And this also has various different um, trade routes. Uh, all these lines are various major trade, route, trade routes. And this one in particular, this big long orange line, um, basically goes all the way, you, it, it doesn't extend, but it goes basically all the way almost to Japan, but certainly all the way to China. And then it comes down through Constantinople and Byzantium and then makes its way uh, further west. And this over here is Venice. And we will get to that here in a minute. And then let me show you one more map of um, Khazaria. Uh, and here it is. This one's a little bit clearer. It doesn't have the uh, trade routes. I wanted you to see those trade routes, though, because that's key to how they became very powerful. And Khazaria was here. And then here's Constantinople, Byzantium down here, uh, and then eventually Istanbul. 
And so, uh, yes, I wanted to talk about them because you can't really talk about the black nobility without, without understanding uh, Khazaria and uh, a, a certain Ashkenazi bloodlines, such as eventually the Rothschilds of Warburg, some of these other dynastic families. And the Rothschilds would eventually become the official bankers of um, the Vatican, actually, interestingly enough. So this, of course, is a very contentious subject, and I'm going to do my best to be delicate about it, but we also don't want to brush it under the rug, nor do I want to succumb to this kind of theory on the internet that the buck stops with the Khazarian mafia, you know, uh, which there, there is truth to that. They seem to act as a, can you say that word? It's not concierge, it's con conciliary. Conciliary, yeah. yeah. So the, that's basically the person who follows orders for the mafia don, and they have a tremendous amount of power. It's sort of the administrative the, class, Yeah, the you advisor, know. you know. The advisor, right. And so if you go back and you watch The Godfather, um, it's played by, I think, Robert Duvall is the... Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, fan, if you haven't seen The Godfather, turn this off and watch something of high quality. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, Godfather 3 starts to touch a little bit on what Philip and I are talking about today uh, with the Vatican Bank and so forth. So in, in researching this, uh, it, it, it's a really epic, uh, it's a really epic tale that actually goes all the way back to uh, Samaria and the beginning of the Kali Yuga to some degree, because Samaria becomes the seed culture for what would then become the Akkadians and the Babylonians, and then the Tyrians in Tyre, in Lebanon. And so you might say, well, wait a minute, Ian, I thought you were talking about the Venetian black nobility. We're actually going to be doing a series on this, Philip and I decided, because uh, it's, it's a hot mess. It's, uh, it's crazy how deep this stuff goes. It turns out when you want to figure out who really runs the planet, and they've spent quite a lot of time obfuscating themselves, you have to dig deep into history. And uh, boy, this history is deep. But one of the things that I really want to show today is that the Black nobility are Molochians. That is to say that they worship Moloch, also known as um, Haman Baal, or uh, the Greeks called, uh, called it Kronos. Kronos, the titan that was famous for eating its own children. Um, there's many different names for this god. Uh, and or are you are you wanting to chime in, Philip? Oh uh, no, I I didn't I didn't mean to give that indication, but I could quickly add that the, please, the, for instance, the, the Torlonia family are the high are more elevated primary official bankers for the Vatican, and that it's oh. always been uh, the Venetian. Yeah, they they set up the uh, Bank for International Settlements. You know, ah. the, in Basel, they are. Off the charts, they really make the Rothschilds look like sort of petty nouveau riche interlopers. You know, by comparison, these people are uh, vastly more wealthy and powerful than Rothschilds. Um, and then I was also going to chime in that the Venetians have, for uh, since the beginning, this is one of their strategies: is to push the kind of the the court Jews forward to take the blame and create a kind of a fence. Um, and then also you can see uh, in terms of the movies, John Wick 3 is kind of exposes the whole black nobility. Hmm. Uh, it's incredibly, I would say, uh, it, it, it seems almost surreal and dreamlike and fanciful, but it's actually, I was shocked when I saw it. I'll have to watch How that. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so go ahead, just that. Oh and yeah, keep going. You're and we're gonna way. we're gonna keep just bouncing off each other. Um, it it seems having discussed this a little bit, it seems that I can trace the the these lineages back into ancient times a bit more, which is more interesting uh, to me from an esoteric, occult, uh, magical point of view. Um, and so once I discovered that the Venetian black nobility were kind of a the big dogs and B that they were not Venetian, but were in fact uh, 
Roman senatorial families. And prior to that were entire in Lebanon. That was like the big light bulb moment for me because <laughs> uh, King Solomon and Solomon's temple was built by uh, Hiram Abiff, according to Masonic lore. And even in the Bible, it says Hiram. Uh, there's actually multiple Hirams mentioned, H-A-R-A-M. And that's in around uh, 963 BC, I think. Uh, I'm just real quick checking my notes here. By the way, my notes looks like I was getting ready to write a college paper. It's crazy. And I and again, this is going to end up being a series rather than a one-off thing. It's just too deep a subject. I guess the uh, 957 BCE construction finished on the Temple of Solomon. Now that's interesting because. The, where we get the name Moloch is actually from biblical sources. Um, it was called, that, that god was called um, Hamon Baal, B-A apostrophe A-L. Um, and then the Greeks referred to that god as Kronos, uh, which is another name for Saturn, which is super interesting to me as an esotericist and occultist. That's a, a fascinating link if you know anything about astrology. Um, and then you can, you know, learn about like the black cube and, you know, which you'll see um, uh, cert certain Jewish groups uh, will have the, the little black cube on a little leather tongue, like right over the third eye. And the Mecca is a black cube and on and on right. and on. When you start to go into the black cube thing, it's you start to see that Saturn worship is at the heart of all powerful things. In fact, they replaced uh, the Twin Towers with an inverted black cube. That's the 9-11 memorial is an inverted black cube that goes into the ground, actually. <laughs> so the markers of these Malachians are everywhere. Um, and after Solomon's temple was built, uh, he got in trouble with God, right? According to, you know, bi biblical God, right? Uh, because he took Tyrian wives, wives from Tyre, which is in modern day Lebanon, and uh put up a Moloch statue outside of town because his wife wanted there to be Moloch worship there. And that's where the term Moloch comes from. I just like that the sound of that word because it sounds exactly like what it is. It's a very dense, very dark vibration. Um, and uh, if, if you watch my channel a lot, you know, I go on and on about Moloch. It's because people will say, oh, Satan, which is to me a worthless term. It just means the adversary in uh, ancient Greek. That's all it means. Uh, oh. It, uh, it doesn't really have any meaning. Or people blame Lucifer or Baphomet because of the um, goat of Mendes, uh, Eliphas Levi's famous thing. That's the being that's a hermaphrodite and has one hand up like that and one hand down. And it's, it's a very misunderstood symbol. It's actually like a, a god of alchemy. It's, it's, it's really basically nothing to do with um, what people would refer to as Satanism. And so... Uh, yeah, so, so Tyre also then seeds Carthage, which uh, Carthage was like a, a colony of Tyre. Uh, and let me just put up real quick a screen share from a, uh, here's, here's an ancient, oops, here's an old, darn it, an old picture of Moloch from uh, back in the day. Someone made this thing and they would have the statue and then they would heat it up. And uh, you see they're thrown in fire there in the back. And then they'd put babies right in the hands of this bronze statue. And the babies would uh, cook alive. Uh, that's one of the big hallmarks of Moloch is this um, sacrifice and also ritual Epstein style harm of children. That was part of what made me become convinced years ago um, that Moloch was actually the deity that we needed to be focusing on and not some of these other things. I'm going to share one other um, it's a screenshot from actually the first movie shown on the White House lawn in uh, 1914 to Mr. NWL president himself, uh, Woodrow Wilson. There it is, Kabiria, the Temple of Moloch. And there's the Moloch statue. And they, they throw a kid, actually that chest compartment opens up and they throw a kid down into it and then steam comes out of the mouth. You can look this up on YouTube if you want. Um, it's kind of disturbing. Like there's even theories that there was an actual sacrifice during this movie. I don't know if that's true, but very creepy. And so if you if you know what to look for, you'll start to see Moloch. In fact, they just rolled out a Moloch statue uh, in the Coliseum not too terribly long ago. It's saying, talking about trying to say it was about Carthage. No, 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 no. And so um, Tyre is very powerful for a long period of time. And then Alexander the Great comes and in 
let's see, what year is it that Alexander the Great destroys it? In 332 BC, after what many uh, military scholars consider the greatest siege in history, Alexander the Great destroys the island city-state of Tyre. Because um, Tyre, there's Tyre on the mainland, and then there's also Tyre, which was on this island. And the island was super fortified, and it had crazy underwater defenses, all this stuff. Look it up at some point, the Siege of Tyre by Alexander the Great, roundly considered by military historians, the greatest siege in human history. Um, absolute brilliance by Alexander the Great. It was the hardest thing he ever did until he got slapped in India. Um, yeah, pretty interesting. So after crushing the after crushing Tyre, that's um, by that point uh, you're getting very close to Roman Empire times, and basically the Tyrians were like, okay, well we watched Carthage get crushed in the Punic Wars. Alexander came and, and crushed us. We this isn't this is no longer um, a great place to live. By the way, Tyre. One of the interesting things about it is. Um, the genesis of uh, ro the idea of royal purple, it comes from these uh, molluscs called the murex. And the murex, um, you have to crush, I don't know, it's something insane, like a thousand of them to get a single gram of this. And it makes this beautiful, dark, what we call royal purple. And in the ancient times, it was the only source for it. And so they became fabulously wealthy uh, because of this trade in the purple dye. Uh, Tyre even came under control of the pharaohs. One of the things I'm not going to touch on at all today is the pharaonic and Egyptian connections uh, and streams and currents that relate to Tyre and, and the Venetian black nobility, the Hyksos and some of the other stuff. It's just, this is a vast, vast sprawling thing. And I'm just trying to give a, a bit of an overview here. So Tyre gets crushed. And then basically the what we call the Venetian black nobility who looked like they might even be Akkadian and Babylonian royalty who moved over to Tyre after the fall of uh, Babylon, first Akkadia, and then they moved to Babylon, and then they move over to Tyre. It seems, in fact, that um, there's some language markers in the language they had in Tyre that shows it's Akkadian. If you're a magical scholar, Akkadian, Babylon, and Sumeria are kind of like, really, along with Egypt, are kind of like the, uh, the major sources of Western magical traditions uh, that then eventually got filtered down and came through Solomonic magic, interestingly enough. A little bit came through there. Um, so they get crushed Ooh. in, uh, they get crushed by Alexander the Great, and they basically move to Rome, which Rome is at that point uh, is like a, a, a burgeoning republic at that point. It's just starting. And they become senators. And among other things, the uh, modern day Orsini family was uh, the Maximus clan and was a very powerful senatorial. They constantly had senators there in Rome. They basically took their ill-gotten loot and I would say their magic and also their uh, Moloch worship and they moved on over to uh, Rome. And then when Rome fell, they move, moved over to Venice. And then, and here's where I'm going to have Philip talk a bit, uh, because this is where he comes, uh, sort of has like a lot more interesting stuff to say. And, and I'm going to go back later and backfill some of the stuff I just talked about. And like I said, this is a unbelievably deep topic. Like, I, I, I've been astonished. I mean, I've been looking for years and years and years to figure out who the fuck rules <laughs> this planet, because it is not clear at all. I mean, the only thing that was clear to me is it definitely wasn't like presidents and prime ministers. That was utterly clear to me. And you can say, oh, it's bankers, but then who are the bankers? And like Philip said earlier, they've been pushing forward, these black nobility families have been pushing forward um, Jews as the scapegoats and also that uh, administrative uh, sort of layer for a long, long time. And this isn't to say that certain Jewish families like the Rothschilds, for example, don't have any blood on their hands or responsibility in all this. They most certainly do. Um, but it's important to note that Khazaria was still running and, uh, and still an empire and they were just hanging out over there uh, when the black nobility was busy, like starting to bankrupt, uh, sort of like they weren't really countries in those days, but various different principalities and like little fiefdoms and dukedoms and whatever all throughout Europe. They were bankrupting like nuts long before Khazaria fell to the point to where the, the popes began to feel that 
they were a threat to their power, um, that they were just too powerful, and that these popes wanted to pull that power into the Vatican proper and away from these um, these families that were trying to have a monopoly on the papal bloodlines. And they passed, uh, they basically banned for laity, uh, meaning non-clergy. And clergy was like 461 AD, and for laity, the year where they banned usury is, do do do. I wrote this down because it's important. Give yeah, I me mean, just a sec here. Uh, 1179 AD. And Casaria's final fall, it got weakened uh, in 969 uh, when the invasion of Rus by, uh, boy, talk about butchery, Svivatoslav I of Kiev uh, in 969 AD. But the, the, or the uh, Black nobility is already deep in Roman and Venice stuff long before that. And then the final fall of Casaria seems to be around 1224 AD, which that's interesting to me because that lines up with around the time that you start to see um, Jewish people being used as money lenders in Europe. Because by that point, pretty much everybody in Europe knew about the black nobility and they hated them. And with good reason, because they're so, so nasty. That name, by the way, black nobility is what they refer to themselves as. Uh, because they were so like, look at our power, bro. I mean, and they were just flexing on everyone with how powerful they are. And so um, I'm going to now turn it over to, to Philip to just chime in on whatever he wants to talk about here about like the intricacies of what happens when these various families were vying for control of the papacy and, and then that impact on Europe and trade and economics. And just whatever you want to say at this point, Philip, it's going to be pretty loose format today, guys. It's it's just too big of a yeah. subject. It really is. And and if anybody uh, disagrees or wants to correct anything that we're saying, please, this is a you know this is the beauty of what what we're doing that it is uh, it's collaborative. Um, yes, the the Venice became the center as Rome, Rome was collapsing and the wealthy families uh, sort of fled to Venice and built this improbable gem of a city on the on this swamp. And then they set up the, through the, the Fondi, the, well, the combined, they combined the wealth of the top families and had a system where they elected a doge. And then uh, around 1171, they, Instead, they had a they they replaced the Doge with a kind of a great council. They held during the 11th and 12th centuries. They held the the privileged trading rights, and they financed uh, the first of the Crusades. And then they handed out uh, feudal sort of parcels of land to the top families, and then basically that amplified their financial power, and um this the it really became like the the embodiment of fascism although it's called the you know venice was called the serene republic but in fact it was a very brutal murderous form of very dark uh fascism uh in in the true sense um they did set about the sorts of things that we see today, how countries are destroyed and kept down by uh, the IMF and the World Bank. Th these kinds of uh, debt and debt slavery where they would, they would hold these fairs, you know, every year they would invite wealthy people and nobles to these sort of financial fairs and they would, uh, you know, offer money and services and they would in debt people to themselves and they would provide them whatever they wanted. You know, they used uh, drugs, uh, money, sex, assassinations, all the dirty tricks. And they would hook countries saying, hey, you need some money? Uh, yes, we can lend you some money. Uh, and then come back and say, oh, you don't, you can't pay us back? Well, maybe we'll take your woolen industry because you can't pay us back. And then you see European economies collapsing and you see widespread misery, absolute misery, just the kind of thing you're seeing, you're seeing in Africa caused by the same kinds of machinations. Yeah. And finally, in uh, 1509, 
you had the War of the League of Cambrai, where pretty much all the European states got together and said, we are absolutely sick of this. Uh, England didn't participate, and they all descended on Venice and very nearly destroyed the, the so-called Republic, and the Pope intervened, and I can't remember exactly um, what he did to save them, but ap after that point, the Venetians realized, I mean, they were incredibly also very accomplished. I don't mean to suggest that that's, they did, they did amazing things, shipbuilding and their, uh, the kind of an empire, I mean, astonishing accomplishments, but to keep other people down, the kinds of things we see today from the IMF is not, nothing is new about any of this. And they, uh, they eventually caused so much misery, you had the War of League Cabrai, and then they realized, they said, wow, you know, Financially, we're very powerful, but militarily, we're a bit vulnerable. Hmm. So they decided to begin to spread some of their banking houses northward uh, to into Geneva and Amsterdam. And then ultimately, uh, you had the, the creation of the Venetian party in England, which Shakespeare was writing about in his plays, the, the dangers of this party. The Venetian party and its uh, stranglehold, it gradually was able to have full power over uh, the British crown through uh, Henry VIII. They had engineered, they had stepped in to resolve his kind of uh, divorce problem. It was the Venetian <laughs> agents. The Venetian agents did this. The Venetian agents were behind the Reformation. They ran Martin Luther like, uh, you know, an asset. He was an asset of. That, that was one thing they realized. Well, we'll, we'll create the Protestant uh, movement, Reformation, and we'll, we'll, you know, cause these two massive forces to, uh, you know, wipe each other out and we'll wow. embroil the continent in, um, in, in, in this religious war that will go on and on. And then they'll leave us alone and we'll kind of fund both sides and it, from a kind of a cynical position, they were the ones behind the Hundred Years' War. They were behind the Thirty Years' War. Some people say that the Orsini family was behind the Black Plague, that they had agents oh. that were sent out to poison the well water. Wow. This was not, this was not what we're told in history books, uh, a result of mice coming back, uh, coming from China or rats. That would and make sense because they, they controlled that Silk Route trade uh, network. Sorry, continue. Yeah, so it, it was a good cover story, but this is, and apparently the Orsini family today is also very connected with some of the German pharmaceutical companies like Merck, and they work together, they've worked together in, in the very recent past, and plagues and this kinds of thing, engineered illnesses, this is, there's nothing new about <laughs> any it of this. It won't kick off the algorithms, but viewers know what yeah, yeah. Philip's alluding to there. <laughs> Unless the spirit of Elon Musk is going to permeate into uh, YouTube land and we're maybe given a bit of a, uh, <laughs> some more freedom. But uh, yes, yeah, so... They also, if, if you don't mind me tagging in there, um, they also like seem to be behind Napoleon and also bankrolling uh, the English. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, th that's what they do is they, they, they play both sides against the middle. They kind of develop that, like Philip is saying, um, with, uh, with the, I, I didn't know that they uh, were behind Martin Luther. It makes sense, right? Whenever you see someone just appear in history, a good example here Rothschild and then all of a sudden they're just super dominant out of nowhere you got to ask yourself how does that happen and the answer is it doesn't and I would say that this is you know a, a classic example that's fairly provable it's a bit contentious is when JP Morgan died it was discovered that basically almost none of his wealth just a few million went to his family and the billions he had because he was one of America's first billionaires along with Rockefeller his billions actually were owned by the Rothschilds. And Rothschilds were so hated 
that they weren't allowed to come into the U.S. in the 1800s, so they had to use front men. But see, it's like Russian nesting dolls where you just open it up again and again and again. But at the middle, it's always these Black nobility families if you dig deep enough. But please continue, Philip. I just wanted to say that about Napoleon and, and, and this, this method of using front men. Yeah, and that brings up a point that I need to, to go into. Uh, Napoleon defeated ultimately the Venetian Republic in, when was it? 1797. So I need to dig into what, what really happened there. Mm -hmm. um, but just to give people some sense uh, of these people that are largely in the shadows and very much by design and very much uh, by their own desire. Uh, Diana, Princess Diana talked about these trips she would take with uh, Prince Charles and Queen Elizabeth. They would go to Venice and they would meet with the head of the Pallavicini family. And apparently Queen Elizabeth told Diana, never, never talk about these trips and the, hmm. the British monarchy would pay tribute to the Pagliaccini. They were a higher level. My, my personal kind of hypothesis at this point is that the British monarchy are kind of Johnny's come lately and that they are given a kind of status relative to the continental nobility if they agree to be kind of the administrators of the planet. You know, the Queen Elizabeth is the center of the, the Committee of 300, for instance. Um, I don't think it's because they regard her as the most important, but because she's willing to do the job. And that's uh, Davos, by the way, people. That's uh, Committee of 300 is in their name for the people who run Davos. So again, Davos, uh, you also hear me talk about Davos a lot. It's important to understand that Davos is, is a bit like DARPA for the Pentagon. You know, DARPA is a very important thing, but the Pentagon's behind that. Likewise, you know, or that JP Morgan Rothschild thing, you have Davos and it seems like it's important, but really in Davos, you get one figure who's centralized, the Queen of England, and then behind, she's taken orders from yet people further in the shadows. And it's just, it's the Palavincinis and so forth. Please continue, Philip. Yeah, that's it, because it, start, it goes to the, the British East India Company, which was chartered in uh, 1600, and it continued until, what was it? At least late 1700s, I think. 1873. Before the British, before the British East India Company, there was the there was the uh, Dutch East India Company, but it was based on what in Venice was the Levant Company. Hmm. It's the same model, basically the same thing, just within the confines of the Mediterranean and the the Venetian uh, area of financial concern. So there's nothing new. The British East India Company is not really British by nature. It's Venetian. It's entirely Venetian. It's just on steroids, right? They had an opportunity to move their all of their methodology uh, into Britain and build up this British East India Company that began uh, that made that built up its war chest through the opium trade. Mm. So, uh, all of the money that the, the uh, Committee of 300 uses, their war chest that they, that they use to manipulate the world, all of this, as I understand, comes from the opium sales, the, the obscene profits generated by the opium trade that, in fact, still goes on. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's really fascinating because, um, of course, uh, and then it makes you wonder about, like, I'm of the personal belief that the uh, the Chinese economic miracle is that they were bankrolled by these same people. Then the question is, have they broken free from that? Like the, the big the two big questions I have in my mind all the time about what's going on currently geopolitically are who what is Putin doing? He's the most inscrutable figure on earth to me. 
And then only slightly behind Putin being like seeming to play all sides and who knows what he's actually doing or who he's working for. I mean, because if you look at the oligarchs in Russia, then there's some creepy stuff that ties into Khazarian mafia stuff like Semyon Mogovich and stuff like that, who who also appears to have have Trump in hawk. But then you see like Jesuit handlers behind Trump. And then, of course, whenever you see Jesuits, you know that it's the black pope. And if you know it's the black pope, then, you know, it's black nobility. So, I mean, like it, it's it's very weird how all this stuff uh, plays out. But I often wonder, like, is China at war with Davos? Um, and there's certain things that make me th- think that in particular statements Soros, George Soros has made about them uh, in recent uh, the past six or eight months where he was saying that they need to be squeezed and so forth. But then on the other hand, it looks like they played this pivotal role in that um, pharmaceutical uh you know, um, cough, cough things going around. Like, it seems like they played a very central role in that, but are they bag holders? Did they want to play that role? Did it really come from there? You know, so, you know, they contend that it came from American military games that were have, or I mean, uh, uh, international military games that included Americans. Uh, I mean, that's what the, the Chinese government puts for it. I'm just making sure to anger every power center on earth, like I'm a Kennedy or something here, but <laughs> But, um, you know, uh, surely the Chinese, if there's one thing the Chinese really keep in mind all the time when they think of the West, it's the opium wars and the British uh, being under the British boot for that period of time where the British were forcing them to take opium and uh, just massive opium addiction in China and the way the British just bled them dry for like decades, at least. Was it a century? It was at least decades, the opium wars in China. yeah, well, there were two, or some people say there were three. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, basically, I, I see China has an enormous deep state problem, just like the United States. Mm-hmm. It's hard to tell. You know, like when I, was, when I was very young growing up, I remember, you know, being 10 or 11, saying, well, you know, the United States, we say we're for freedom and yet, and liberty, yet look what we're doing in Vietnam, look what we're doing around the world, this doesn't make sense. And I didn't understand any of this schizophrenic identity. Now I understand it. I understand that there was this original impulse for, uh, toward freedom and development and, and personal and uh, community sovereignty, but Uh, The British at once began to try to claw back the United States using um, agents and different forms of subterfuge. Certainly, uh, you see the same thing in China when they set up the banks in Hong Kong. Those same banks are still there. They're still doing the same thing. And they still have a tremendous power over China. And uh, one thing that I uh, encountered that shocked the the hell out of me there was was a fantastic book dope incorporated um saying that the 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 british had become far too obvious in terms of their presence and their power in china so what they agreed to do was to back off and to artificially create this chairman mao figure and this revolution which communism is always used as a tool of when when the monarchy begins to lose favor with the people they create communism, which is a temporary kind of uh, measure that ultimately it's not sustainable and it's destructive. But it allowed the British to pull back and say, oh, we're not, uh, we're not uh, still important. We're no, not still guiding things in China. In fact, they were. In fact, uh, Mao was uh, still, he was an agent. And in fact, the opium trade and the drug running actually worsened they actually were able to sell more drugs after Mao was ensconced in power. So, and he was also funded by, supported by Skull and Bones. Right. They helped him get, he was the editor of a college paper there and they they promoted him. It's like the Bolshevik revolution. It's Anglo-American finance and, and British intelligence and mind control psychological warfare operations and some german gold too <clears throat> yeah and that's so, interesting because yeah. rockefeller was super big in pharmaceuticals uh, in the early part of the uh, 20th century in the early 1900s and then 
that supposedly went away under Mao and then Nixon and Kissinger go over there and they reopen China. And one of the first things that goes in is Rockefeller goes in there hard. And now some vast percentage of the world's pharmaceutical and medical stuff is uh, produced in China. Sorry to just interject, but seems to all weave. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to make a note of that. Uh... And, and so just for people to keep in mind, we're, we're, point, we're, we're trying to piece together like global power relations over the course of millennia. This is what Philip and I meant is because when you try and peel back the layers to figure out who runs things, you, you, you just discover like there's, there's always another layer. And also everything is, is tied together back, going back thousands of years, literally everything is tied together and everything is kind of an expansion of these original earlier models. And that's why if you look back at the very initial beginnings, it's much more clear and it's much more obvious. Things like the fact that Khazaria stands between the Constantinople and the, the Eastern Roman Empire and China and India. And it, it was in this crossroads in Central Asia along the, the old Silk Road. And so it was very important uh, because they were able to take their bite as middlemen. And uh, that's one of the things that these families seem to do is that they like being the middleman and playing two sides against each other. They did a similar thing uh, with uh, Islam and Christianity. Philip talked about the Crusades earlier. There was certain things that was banning trade between the Muslim and the Christian world. And so you use this group called uh, Radites, uh, which is a uh, again, sort of court, court Jews, as Philip put it earlier, uh, to do trade in between the Muslim and Christian world, because of course trade was continuing, even though it was banned, right? Just like you may have noticed that those sanctions on Russia didn't work so hot. People are still buying their oil, right? It's a similar kind of thing. But when you put these artificial barriers in place, you can then insert yourself in the middle and just extract tremendous profits. So anyways, Philip, please continue. I just, this is a very free flowing conversation if you haven't noticed viewer and it, it may be a bit overwhelming but we're giving you lots of rabbit holes and threads to go down. So you can do your own research which you should always do to see that Philip and I, I can pretty much guarantee you, you you'll realize we're onto something here. The degree to which you agree may vary <laughs> but like, it's really incredible how everything circles back into these families, like it, it, everything for, for thousands right. of years. It's just insane. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there's something about conditioning, I would imagine, if you come from a family that has exerted that kind of power for thousands of years, it's in your blood, it's in your nature to do this, and you were born to do it. You do, yeah. you do act according to your nature. If you see John Wick 3, you very much see it's very well dramatized. Mm -hmm. um, back to uh, the Khazarians. Now, what I understand is that the reason that this, this cabal, if you want to call it this new world order that seems to be staffed with these crypto Khazarians, as people say, is that they have a grudge because the Ru it was Russia that destroyed the Khazarian Empire ultimately, and that this is what they're this is what this this blind hatred of Russia it's 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 a it's really a kind of insanity uh, going back to the the Bolshevik Revolution, which was not a Russian revolution at all. Right, it was a weaponized uh, uh, attempt to destroy the Russian state. Correct. and replace it with something they thought they could ultimately take advantage of. So what what do you what do you know about that? Do you, can you give that any credence? Have you encountered that? So 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 one of the things I'm wondering about is um, what do you make of in, in the, the viewer this is related, right? Because um, the, the Bolshevik revolution seems to be funded by Wall Street and and the city of London. And when I say the city of London, I do not mean London, when you fly into Heathrow Airport, I mean, within London, what everyone considers London, there is something called the, the city of London. And it's also called the square banking mile. And just like the Vatican and Washington, D.C., it's a microstate within a host country. 
that has different laws <laughs> from the country that it inhabits. And in fact, if the Queen of England, this is why I'm wondering if you know of a black nobility linked to the city of London, um, when the Queen of England goes into the city of London, uh, the Lord Mayor of London will come out in pomp and circumstance with his chains on his scepter and stuff, and the Queen has to bow to him to enter the city of London. The 2008 crash, if you dig deep enough, you can go back, and, and really every economic crash for forever, it comes from the city of London. It, it seems that the spiritual religious center of this it's not even really a new world order because as uh, Philip and I are pointing out, this is a very old world order in every sense of the word. Uh, it, th they have sort of a, a, a triangle between London, the city of London, this banking square mile, the Vatican and Washington DC. And that it's often called like the religious or priest center, the banking center, and then the military center. The military center being Washington DC, the banking being the, square mile of London. Um, uh, th there's someone named Anthony Sutton who's done a lot of research um, on skull and bones Incredible. and other things, uh, but he also had, had, um, has done a lot of research on the funding of the Bolshevik revolution by Wall Street and the city of London. Um, and there's no question in my mind that um, the Bolshevik revolution is not Russian. Um, again, people, this is, this is why it's so dangerous and I'm very alarmed. I feel like racism has by and large um, really diminished in America over the course of my life, although there's been a bit of a resurgence. But one thing that has absolutely soared in the past 20 years, but especially the last decade, and it just seems to be accelerating, is anti-Semitism. And it concerns me because the Black nobility has a very long standing pattern of whenever people start to go, what the F is going on? Why is everything going wrong? How is there all this debt? How is everyone getting crushed? All our businesses are getting crushed. Someone needs to pay. The black nobility loves to go, it's the Jews. And then they just sit back in the shadows or they also like to go, it's the Masons or it's the Catholics or any, they, they have, they've scapegoated all these different groups repeatedly, but their absolute favorite to scapegoat and it's funny because of certain things within that religion around the concept of the scapegoat itself. Um, but they love to use the Jewish people to bear the brunt. And it's never the Rothschilds or Warburgs, I might add, who bear the brunt of this. They always manage to get away. It's regular people uh, like my ex-wife, my son, um, and my dear friend, uh, who's my, my wife's partner. And, 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 my, and I actually have lots of Jewish friends. And so it's, it's regular people on the ground who end up getting... Um, swept up in violence. And I mean, and that's the whole, you know, people like to trot out, oh, what group has been kicked out of 190 countries? Well, yeah, but why? The answer is, is because they've been the agents for very well paid agents for this black nobility. And you can really trace the fall of uh, Caesarea and then the moving over to Venice. And then Venice seems to absorb these trade routes and use that knowledge of that Central Asian trade route circuitry, so to speak, of the Khazarians who came there as refugees. And I mean, there was definitely an alliance and it's it's murky, there's intermarrying, like there's the, um, what, what were the popes and so forth that were Khazarians, if you wanna jump in here, Philip? It was, uh, Constantine married a Khazarian princess and then they had a son who was Leo the Fourth, Leo the Khazar they called him. And then I think there were perhaps three additional Khazar Popes. Uh, popes or emperors? Because uh, was Leo a pope or was no, he an Leo emperor? The, he was a pope. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, he was he a was, pope. Okay. One of the first yeah. then with Constantine. He must have been one of the early, early ones. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and so there is, there is an intermingling between the two. And what Philip and I are trying to do here is we don't want to, we don't want to knuckle under to this anytime there's any criticizing of, say, the Rothschilds who have a very dark history very awful history, people will just say, oh, that's anti-Semitic. And people go, huh, can't talk about it anymore. But we also don't want to go down this route of these people who are um, do surface level research and they don't want to touch on these black nobility families who, who they're, they're at this point, you can call them Italian because they've been there for 2000 years, but really they're Tyrians and they might even be Babylonians, which is funny because of course, Babylonians, 
this is contentious, but Babylonians enslaved Jews at one point. So how funny, like certain patterns repeating itself through history. And so we're trying to find this balance between discussing this and not letting this administrative class, so to speak, um, of the Khazarians or the Khazarian mafia, as it's commonly called now, off the hook and say they have bare no responsibility. They certainly do. But we also don't want to become fixated on it the way so many people are. And, and that leads to the short circuiting of it just becomes anti-Semitic garbage. And so we're trying to look at things in a way that that's balanced and fair when discussing groups that are have been doing, a, a, you know, doing dirty <laughs> huge portions of the planets for a long time. You notice that Philip and I are mentioning the British over and over and over again. And the British are super central to this. And I love what Philip said, that Britain has been used as its own version of this administrative class. And they were used at the British Empire, it seems, was bankrolled by the same group or is this same group, considering that sax Coburg gotha windsor is a branch. They're a way out in the periphery branch, you know, much closer to the center, the Aldebaranians or senior, more like the trunk, but like they, they are a, a, a branch. And so that's the thing you got to understand, even though it is appears monolithic to a certain degree, it's actually this spider web of things. And there is that Khazarian mafia thing is a very important layer that needs to be discussed. Can't just ignore it, especially given the current conflict in Ukraine, which is uh, especially Eastern Ukraine, that's the heart of Khazaria, crazily enough, you know, the uh, uh, Dontesk and what's the other one? The long... Donetsk and uh, Donbass. Oh, well, see, we'll just have Philip say all the foreign words because he has beautiful pronunciation and I'll stick I just to have a lot of Russian friends. I, I have a lot of, I have probably more Russian friends than American friends. Ian is one of my few American friends. Oh, um, Hmm. Uh, yeah, do you want yeah. to tell about speaking of we also don't want to demonize any of these groups just like i don't want my family and friends to be demonized also even even in the black nobility families it's not like everyone's evil and many of them as my friend grant likes to talk about and philip touched on earlier they've been conditioned it's very you can't you you can't get away you know like in godfather three to take it back there he said, every time I try and get out, they suck me back in, Pacino, you know? Right. You can't, once you're born into those families, it's damn near impossible to get out of it. Like, even if you're like, you know what, I, I wash my hands of this, I want it. The best you can do is just kind of be off to the side and know that your family's continuing doing evil. But if you were to try and come out or, heaven forbid, start talking about this stuff, you'd likely be killed. And some of yeah, them have, be, have, be have, yeah, and some of them have tried to do reasonable things at different times to, to be fair because we, we're trying to be fair here we're trying to be honest transparent and fair and so philip actually is friends with someone who is a fairly famous member of one of these families of one of the most powerful of the uh, black nobility families at least a few hundred years ago in europe they were arguably the most powerful at least they had the most uh, monarchs on the throne they may have not had the real power, but they had the most monarchs of the throne. And so please, Philip, you want to share that little tidbit if you want to. Well, I, I yeah, of course, uh, because it feeds in feeds into what my goals are here, you know, in uh, Mongolia and in international law. Uh, my father is a law professor and he, one of his colleagues, uh, I'm sorry to say he passed away uh, a couple of years ago, um, his name was Dr. Yerzy Toman, and he worked with UNESCO. He was such a delightful gentleman. He was, came from Czech aristocracy, mm. and he was a true prince. The way he talked to his whole manner, um, such gentlemanliness. I had never encountered it before in such a wide-ranging someone who had an incredibly um, uh, rich and not at all naive, but he had a kind of, always a kind of childlike openness. And he wrote the book for UNESCO on the on protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflicts. And I remember he would come to the house for dinner and he would say, oh, I've got 
you know, we just barely finished dinner. I'm sorry, I have to go because they were expecting him to finish the second edition of the of the book. And uh, and I would say, oh, please don't, you don't have to go. Yes, I really must. And uh, now, of course, I, I understand him a lot better now. I used to kind of feel very disappointed that he had to leave, but I had this idea about a, a new center for international law because I said, you, you know, that The Hague is completely political and it, there's no justice anywhere. And this was my big realization. Uh, and I had this idea to establish something in where, where you could be more open that's not quite so political and yet some place where people are educated and there's infrastructure and there's a possibility of generating interest in this is Mongolia and moving ahead with this project. I'd like to have an, in, to set up an institute and maybe even begin with some tribunals at some point. And we, we've had several conferences, yes. We've had, last conference we had, it was on uh, freedom of speech. And we brought, I think I've talked about this before, I won't go into it too much, but we brought lawyers from Japan and Korea and the United States and we did a, a symposium on freedom of speech. And then we did a concert in the evening with the Mongolian Philharmonic and Ooh. the press was there and it was a big deal. And my next plan is to do a symposium on the Roman law, which I won't go into at all. But uh, to me, I'm very excited about doing this. We're planning to do it in June of 2023. So anyway, so I talked to Yerji about this and he said, I think this is a wonderful idea. He said, I want you to meet uh, Carl from Habsburg. He says, come with me to uh, Vienna and I'll introduce you. And I said, oh, of course, wonderful. I'd love this chance. So I went to Vienna, this was in 2013. And Carl was speaking at this little, it was a, there was an inn where Beethoven had written his third symphony, I think. And Carl was giving a speech in this little German, uh, little old fashioned style, like little church right next door. And then the restaurant, the inn where Beethoven stayed, after he finished his speech, we went uh, and um, my first impression of Carl, he was very amiable, very energized, very positive, very affable, very congenial, wonder he's a wonderful man. I got absolutely no bad vibes from from him at all. There was there was just one touchy moment when uh, wasn't he nothing he he you know, He's an emperor. He doesn't get miffed or peeved at things, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Yerji said, you know, Philip has this idea to begin this interna new international law center in Mongolia. And I think Putin would be interested in helping in this. Do you, uh, do you know anyone who's connected to Putin? And Carl said very dryly, he said, um, well, uh, the only people I know who are connected to Putin are now dead. <laughs> and, and I kind of laughed nervously. <laughs> right. <laughs> your Z said, okay, maybe we should drop this subject because Carl had been in Chechnya. He'd been like in the middle of the, mm. the worst of it. Carl is somebody, you know, he, has a, he had a reputation when he was young for being kind of a playboy. And people didn't expect much of him. But as he got older, he got very involved and was always busy, over busy. He travels like 20 days out of the month. He's not in Austria. And uh, he was, I remember, uh, he speaks perfect Spanish. He speaks, of course, French, German, English. I mean, he's a prince. Literally. He's very tall and he's very very pleasant to be around. Mm -hmm. And then we went to the inn, we had a uh, little like uh, traditional uh, Viennese supper and Carl's assistant was there. So it was just the four of us in this little booth. And um, I remember at one point they brought these little meatballs and we were dishing, ladling them out. And I awkwardly 
drop them into Carl's plate and it's, you know, splashed. I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? But he's very cool about it, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, we had, a, I, I, I remember at some point after dinner, Carl had to leave. His daughter had a ballet recital or something and he had to speed off. But uh, then the, there was a musician in the restaurant playing an accordion and I think I sang a Russian song and sang a Schubert song and and then we all went home and it was a you know it was one of those experiences but uh I'm just gonna real quick uh show the viewers uh what this gentleman looks like I should have pulled it up sooner but is that him yes yeah Yeah. he looks a bit glum in there Mm -hmm. he's there's other wait, ones. Wait, this wait. one was just maybe the most impressive looking picture. There's some other ones of him just because he looked yeah. the most like a, you know, little insignia right there. I'd like to zoom in on that. But um, yeah, here he is. And look at that in the background. Check out that mustache. That's, seen, that's real royalty when you see a mustache like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I he, they, you don't get the best impression of him from those photos, but he's just wonderfully charming. And oh, I believe you. very, very gracious and forgiving me my idiocies and faux pas, uh, you know. And um, but Yerji said uh, before he passed away, he said, um, unfortunately, his health was never uh, during the last few years. I used to feel awful because his he never he was he didn't like to exercise. No exercise. He wanted to eat what he wanted to eat, and he mm-hmm. just was not health conscious. And uh, so, at a certain point, he was not able. He was actually not able to come to Mongolia. I had wanted to bring mm-hmm. him here and introduce him to people. Yeah. Uh, as far as I can see, there is no one else like him. I have not met anyone. Yeah who can hold a candle to him in terms of the breadth of his knowledge, the purity of his integrity and his, his absolute, this, this uh, princely outlook on life mm-hmm. that was not contaminated with politics, you know? Yeah. Uh, but he had known Carl for, he'd be connect, he was connected with the family for a long time. And, uh, one of Carl's assistants, in fact, it was the next day he he drove me out to the countryside and we met his family in the countryside of, of Austria, for like farmland. And I couldn't understand anything they were saying, you know. Mm-hmm. It was a, it's not this German that I know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Austrian but then, German. But when, what Yerzy said, uh, he told me, make, make propaganda for Carl in Mongolia. Make propaganda for Carl in Mongolia. (laughs) And I had absolutely no idea how to do that. I'm I'm trying to figure it out. I've seen, you know, I've I've watched some of his presentations. I've listened to some of his Mm -hmm. uh, uh, interviews on uh, uh, Carl, that is. Mm -hmm. And he's not happy at all with the... The, uh, the rise of nationalism, which he sees as a potentially defeating his family's dream of united Europe. Right, and which the Habsburgs have dreamt of that for centuries, literally centuries. Habsburg, right. That was part of their strategy of marrying all those families was to try and prevent war in Europe, which is kind of noble in a way. And, and this is what I mean, like, the... the, the, the even in these families that we're saying are so dark and run the world, there are good people. And there's also seen branches. I happen to think the Habsburgs are, not everyone's going to agree with this. And of course they'd span centuries, but I think the Habsburgs are, are, are certainly one of the more benevolent of the branches of the uh, black nobility in my estimation. Anyways, they seem to have been very much anti-war, whereas there's other branches that are like steady diet of war. So Oh, very much, very much so. And they also still, uh, they have incredible power today and incredible wealth. They're far wealthier than the Rothschilds. And the Habsburgs? The power they, yes. And they're, the power they exert, of course, it's not as, it's below the surface. 
but they're still one of the very top top families. But at, you know, as I said, I I I felt nothing but good energy from him. I don't agree with some of the things he says. I think you know the failure of the Euro European Union, why why it's such a mess, is because they went about it in the wrong way. They handed the project to these sort of uh, you know. Uh, managerial class. And they always make the most of everything. This is not the way they went about it was completely wrong. And I I think it's I think it's a wonderful idea, United Europe, but you can't enforce it from the top down. You have to seed it from the bottom up. You have to tell children from a very early age, oh yes, we are French or we are Italian, we're very proud, but we're also European and we have this other identity. And then 10 years later, you say you begin to build, hey, remember we talked, we've been talking about this. We should form institutions that will strengthen this identity. And then you would begin to have something shaping up that would be organic. You're right. Could actually, you know, what there is now is, is absolute travesty. It's absolutely awful. Yeah. And um, it all began with change. steel and coal tariffs, weirdly. <laughs> like getting rid of steel and coal tariffs after the end of World War II is what started the European Union. Just some agreements that they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't do tariffs back and forth between uh, West Germany and some other parts of Europe around uh, steel and coal. And that was the, the, oh. the nugget that started. Yeah, it's even on the EU website if you read it. It's quite interesting. I mean, there's a lot of stuff also about the EUs and their links to, uh, well, to 1940s German politics as well, which also, you, I, I don't know this particular thing, but given everything we said today, I'm pretty sure you can find a black nobility hand behind that as well, uh, especially through some of the uh, German. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Behind, ev behind everything, the German nobility, they were all pumping up and propping up and getting this Hitler uh, conspiracy going because they see it as a chance to to grab power and grab property and get back at their rivals. And it's very, a uh, very cynical kind of uh, operation for them. I've also heard that uh, World War I and World War II were both to like permanently vanquish, um, I guess, rival monarchies and so forth. Like the czar has been gone for, the czar's family was wiped out, for example, in World War I. Uh, and, and the Bolshevik Revolution came right on the heels of it. So, yeah. And so, uh, the, uh, yeah, the Habsburg Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, they uh, World War One kind of put the kibosh on the, on those. Yes. Right. Right. And uh, it seems that some of the nastier sorts uh, who were more in the shadows already were wanting to. Uh, uh, break the political power of the Habsburgs and the and the Czar in particular. That's part of the reason that I suspect the Habsburgs are perhaps a bit more reasonable than the other ones is specifically because of that, uh, because their their power was, yes, they're still fantastically wealthy beyond my wildest dreams, but they uh, they also had their political power broken to a massive degree uh, during World War One. So Philip, um, it'll it'll be instant for the viewer, although. Um, I may do something different than I've done before. I might insert, um, we'll see. I might insert something here after this. If, if something pops in briefly between, uh, uh, during this pause, then you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but we're gonna take a real quick break, which will be instant for you viewer, but um, uh, Philip and I, it'll uh, be, be a few minutes just because I have drank some tea and uh, need the restroom. So how's that sound uh, there, Philip? We'll just take a quick break. All right, okay. great. Okay, and we're back. So um, I wanted I wanted Philip to share that uh, that bit about Carl von Habsburg because I want to point I want to point something out again. Even though literally some of these families are literally uh, working for um, a demon, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, Moloch, and some of them uh, are as was discussed on another one of my show and. Um, Philip uh, is is of a is of a, a different uh, mystical bent than I am. I suppose would be one way to put it. And so I'm not trying to say this is Philip's belief. This is, this is my personal um, belief here. Uh, I, I had the guest uh, in the the prior week's show, um, Sammy Richard, and he talked about how some amount of the people who run the world are quite literally possessed by demons, and that might explain why 
you have people like Philip's friend, Carl, who is a totally reasonable person and benevolent feeling and all this stuff. Um, and then you have these machinations you see where things are super nasty and you can see modern day cult of Moloch stuff uh, appearing here, here and there, whispers in Hollywood and elsewhere, things like adrenochrome and this sort of thing. Um, that might explain why sometimes you're seeing like more reasonable people and then some of them just seem quite literally possessed. Like there's some very dark rumors about um, some of, I, I want to say that Philip was saying it was the, the, the Orsini family that we won't get into it because it's just a little bit too awful um, even for this show. And uh, I guess what I want to say is when people think of the mafia, for example, and funny, they're Italian <laughs> or Sicilian, People are like, oh, yeah, the mafia. And so the mafia sounds like it's this monolithic group. And yet within the mafia, there's actually many different families, right? And this is true with all, almost all different organized crime. Like people say the Russian mob. Well, the thing is, is the Russian mob has different dons within it. It has different mafia bosses and they fight with each other. And some of them are more ruthless and some of them are more reasonable within the context of they're all like criminal overlords. So when we talk about the Black nobility, first of all, it's a vast, sprawling group of many different branches of families. And there's, of course, real variation between the most ruthless, which um, seem to be the ones that have generally won out. Of course, it's uh, the Kali Yuga. And so that is supported by natural law for the next couple of years until Kali Yuga ends. And so the most ruthless, um, especially when we're talking about you know, the machinations of the ultimate and power elite, of course, the most ruthless are going to more likely come out on top. And so when we're talking about the black nobility, we're using a catch-all term that describes many, many, many families. It's probably, um, I don't know, 30 to 60,000 people, something in that range. It's not that many. It's maybe 100,000 or something like that. But think about it. Any group of 100,000 people, no matter how, try and, how homogenous a group you try and find, there's going to be tremendous variation within a group that large. There's going to be saints and sinners. There's going to be people who are unbelievably kind and people who are utterly, utterly ruthless in any group of 100,000 humans that you could grab. And so it's important to understand that we're trying to bring to light the rulers of the planet and understand that, yes, many of them are very ruthless in the operational level, meaning the day-to-day -day doings of what happens of the people who sort of follow their bidding, these administrative classes we've been talking about, whether it's the Khazarians or it's the, the British or it's Wall Street or it's the city of London or DC or whatever administrative layer we're talking about, you know, there's good people in corporations and then the corporation will look profoundly evil as a whole. And so when you're talking about the black nobility as a whole, yes, it's very, uh, very dark. I mean, it's who's been running the planet basically doing during the vast majority of Kali Yuga. They've, you know, they were ex extremely influential in the Roman Empire, extremely influential in the Vatican. We're about to talk about the papacy and papal bloodlines a bit more. Um, you know, they're very influential in central banking. I mean, these are nasty organizations, no doubt about it. But it's important that we allow for humanity, even within these groups of people who, uh, are the ultimate wealthy people. And it's especially important because I think everybody watching this wants to see a change away from the way things are working right now, especially this awful thing that's occurring right now, this attempted sort of global coup d'etat that's occurring. I think almost everyone wants to see a change. And one of our best hopes for moving forward um, is that schisms appear within these power elite. And I believe they're already there. There's lots of indications of that. And the thing is, is that if, if we sit here and talk about these people and just demonize them and everybody leaves the show going, oh my God, the black nobility, they're all evil. And then more reasonable members of the black nobility, this ultimate and power elite, people like Carl von Habsburg and so forth, hear, hear this as just a um, mudslinging towards their family or whatever, that's going to harden them when maybe they would be open more if we allow for their humanity. And I will say, if by some bizarre 
quirk of fate, any member of the black nobility does watch this and they're maybe having doubts about the way some of the things have happened, you know, have run within their family for periods of time and they want to move things in a different direction. And I believe that there are people within the greater black nobility, which again is like 30 to 60,000 people, something like this. They, you know, I would love for them and would encourage them, please help bring about a more benevolent, reasonable, harmonious, productive, expansive planet. Like for the love of gravy, please like try and rein in your cousins that are more cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and doing harm, you know? So it's, I just want, it, it's important that we not deny the humanity of these people. That said, yes, maybe some of them are, as Sammy Richard, my previous guest was saying, some of these people definitely seem to be possessed by demons, even willingly so. And, and then at that point, that's a little bit different. People like that just have to be, have their power removed from them. That's really the only way forward. But I don't want people coming away from this, denying the humanity of these people, uh, as, as, a, as a whole, you know, nor, nor do I want people coming away with that this is a monolithic group that's all, you know, of one mind and of one vision, because that, that's quite clearly not the case. And again, we want to encourage the more reasonable people within those families to awaken and, and, and become more reasonable members of society and use that tremendous wealth and power and influence they have to help steer the planet uh, in a better direction. And really that's one of the great hopes we have is uh, fractures appearing within uh, these elite rulers and more reasonable factions coming out on top, which will be supported by natural law here in a few years. And so I believe that's destined to happen, but I just wanted to say that piece because I think that anytime you start to demonize a group of people, whether it's communists or Russians or Chinese or Jews, or black nobility even, even though obviously, like look at this discussion, right? Um, you, you harden them into their behavior that they're already doing. And you also begin to harden something inside yourself. And you begin to move down a road yourself of being less compassionate and less reasonable. And that gives us this nasty, bloody cycle of history in a nutshell is that hardening of it's us and them and that divisiveness. And we're trying to move towards a more harmonious planet, not a this more of this Kali Yuga extreme duality stuff. And so with, uh, with that uh, little monologue there, um, Philip, did you want to tell us about this ancient schism uh, that happened within uh, the papacy? Um, or maybe not ancient, but at least uh, medieval, right? Because it's medieval, this thing you're about yeah, to talk yeah. about. Uh, let me go back just a bit to, Please. it's interesting you mentioned the mafias. Yeah. You know, like the Albanian mafia, they're controlled under the jurisdiction of the Russian mafia, the Russian mafia, many places pay tribute to the Italian mafia. Most mafias, in fact, eventually pay tribute through intermediaries and the money generally it's it goes toward the Massimo family which some people say the Massimo family is the most powerful family and they control all all the world's mafias one one rumor i heard is that as you know all governments are corporations and the head of the Massimo family, whose name is Don Fabrizio Massimo Brancaccio, he apparently owns all, he says he owns all of the uh, corporations that are countries. Wow. And he apparently is, uh, I, I don't want to characterize, you know, I'm very much, law is the most important thing to me. And mm -hmm. these are allegations, okay? Yeah. These are allegations. People and rumors. Say, they say he is the most dangerous, frightening, powerful human being on the planet. And that the Massimos are basically the biggest source of all of this. Um, so all the mafias, including going down to the street level, uh, the hip hop world, Hollywood mafia, Las Vegas, the five families of New York, the Chicago outfit, Chicago Outfit works with the Democratic Party. The Chicago Outfit has uh, agreements and arrangements with the Mexican Mafia, with like MS-13. And most of the Mexican Mafias and Latin American Mafias are 
run and owned by the House of Bourbon in Spain. Wow. So motorcycle gangs, mafias, prison gangs, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Hells Angels, uh, these are owned by the black nobility. They run yeah. them. It's crazy. It's crazy. And when you think about that, think about the street level dealers. Think about any show you've seen about drug dealers, right? There's the little people who are out there selling on the street and then they have their little boss that runs however many of those dealers. And then that guy goes and it goes up. And, you know, if you watch the show, The Wire, fantastic show again, turn this off and go watch The Wire. I'm just kidding, but that is a fantastic oh. show in that there's the little guys and then it gets all the way up to Stringer Bell, or I forget what the guy in the first season is, but um, it all comes up like a pyramid. And, and, and all those little guys in the bottom give money all the way up. And then basically almost all the money ends up going to the, to the guy at the very, very top. And, and, and he's saying that there's pyramids upon pyramids, <laughs> which is insane. Oh, yeah. It makes a lot it, of sense to goes, me. It goes up. I think it goes up a lot higher than any of those shows will let oh, off. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the entertainment is a sense. Except for John Wick 3, that really went all the way, but it seems so preposterous and surreal. No one is going to watch it and say, I wonder if that's really true. It seems so completely fanciful that it, in fact, was very truthful. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to have to watch that now. You've got me super yeah, yeah. intrigued. I haven't seen it. So, yeah. They do this with, you know, like I heard the, uh, the Bourne movies, Jason Bourne. Mm -hmm. that the, these movies are about 80 percent true it's revelation and of the reason, method is what that's called it's actually a black magic technique believe it or not i believe it yeah and, you have you to know, you have to reveal you have to sort of reveal to your victims that you're a vampire before before um before they invite you into your house if they just invite you into your house and you haven't revealed you're a vampire then it's not fair so you have to be like, haha, when I was in Transylvania last year, sucking blood, kind of joking. And the person <laughs> thinks you're joking. Oh, come on in. And then you're like, ah. so, but, but, but what it is, is it's about, um, it's about consent. And so you, you, you let people know what you're doing. Um, and, and, and this is one of the things that bothers me sometimes about being a truther is that I'm like, man, am I, am I freaking helping them with the, uh, with this revelation of the method, like black magic thing, like, you know, that that's why I always try to then speak into the existence that they're going to fall or evolve or whatever, you know, um, I always try and add that in whenever I'm talking about these kind of dark truths, but yeah, they have to, they have to let you know what they're doing on some kind of level. And then you consent to it. That consent can come through extreme coercion, but uh, it can't come through actual force um force then is it negates certain elements of certain strains of black magic i mean it's it's very complicated it could be its own show really um maybe it will be at some point but um just i wanted to say that because that a lot of hollywood stuff uh and super bowl halftime shows and olympic opening game yeah, yeah, yeah. are either actual rituals or it's either actual rituals or revelation of the method uh which is its own um, its own black magic in, in a way, or, or rather it's, it's a method, it's a technique within certain black magic systems. So, yeah, but sorry, please continue. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and the other thing is it, 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 it provides a kind of, because if more, let's say there are people who've been in these programs like Jason Bourne, these programs exist. And if somebody comes out and starts talking about it, People go, oh, it's like the movie. I saw that, and I saw the born identity. Come on. So it, it's yep. like leading people off, you know, like back to the anti-Semitism thing. I had a friend, and he hated Jews to such a point. I'm like, look, you're wrong. There's people higher. This is what's really going on. I would send him source after source after source. It could not put a dent in what he had built up through just years of emotion mm -hmm. and now we're not friends anymore but mm -hmm. i really try you know this the, you, you look at uh, you know the the power of emotion and how it can be uh, kind of uh, tweaked and amplified through these kinds of 
well, I guess this is black magic, isn't it? It's it's manipulation of the mind, the uh, external manipulation for, you know, not you, you adopt attitudes and take actions that are not in your own best interest because, and you're not aware that they've been kind of implanted there, you know, through these halftime shows and movies and things like this. Well, um, it, just real quick, a lot of magic is mental in nature. That is an aspect of it, but there also is the fact that the universe is mental in nature. And so, um, you can affect change over time by operating at like the mental or um, archetypal level. And then it filters down. Like one way I explain this to people who aren't, you know, uh, esotericists is that if you think about it, everything, every human endeavor that's ever happened, where did it happen first? It happened in the mind first. Every war was conceived in a mind. Every invention was conceived in a mind. Every architectural blueprint, every scientific breakthrough, everything. People will say, oh, well, that doesn't apply to, to nature and animals and whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, it does. But you're operating with a different level of mind there. There's like sort of there's the layer of mind, which is the God mind. And, and, and we have that within us to some degree. But there's also it also operates independently of humans as well. And so you can see it from that level. And even now quantum physics is starting to show how the universe is, is mental in nature. And they're, they, they're, they're refusing to look at the obvious, which is that the mystics and, and hermetic principles, for example, and so forth, various mystical mystics have said the universe is mental in nature for the dawn of time, you know, the Vedas, right? But... The scientists are like, ooh, they don't, they really are resistant to anything that sounds like it's mystical. And yet, again and again and again, various different quantum mechanics experiments show <laughs> that no, the mystics are right and have always been right. And they just don't want to say that because, interestingly enough, it goes back to British nonsense royal societies and so forth who made science uh dead materialist in nature uh yes. meaning that everything is just matter and that's it and that, that was, was a the venetian outlook you know that we huh? were biological that was the venetian outlook you know yeah. the, the view that we are not this as i understand it was a kind of dichotomy between Florence, which said that we are made in the image of God, we are creators, we are divine, invested with divine powers, and then the Venetians like, come on, you're biological, you're hackable animals, right? You're slaves, you're hackable animals, you're subject to our manipulations, and this is this idea that you have creative powers and a soul, this is just an illusion. Right. And to me, uh, dead materialism is the single most poisonous ideology in the history of humanity, bar none. And I will tell you why. First of all, if you look at some of the most repressive regimes in history, uh, they're communist. Almost all of the most repressive regimes in history are communists. And, Very materialistic. Right. Atheism. And, and not just atheist with perhaps spiritual, uh, which my, my friend uh, uh, was, was saying this. Um, and she was like, you know, there is such a thing as a spiritual atheist. And I was like, okay. Um, but w dead materialism, I think, is a better, is a better term for this um, because it doesn't posit the existence of God or not at all. But this dead materialism is at the height or at the center of, of communism. Why? Well, it's because if you believe that everything's material, you're going to be very attached to your life because you just got one YOLO, you only live once, right? Like, oh no, I could die. And so you're very fearful of your body because you don't believe in reincarnation. And you're gonna be much more likely to knuckle under to brute force and things like that. And you're much more likely to feel hopeless and disconnected. And you're not going to use your natural abilities as we're all natural magicians to strike back at the real powers that be who, absolutely know that everybody's a magician and they don't want competition. And so if you can push this idea of dead materialist atheism, 
then it leads right into technocracy and transhumanism and all the rest of this stuff. And, and what's more, those things all seem inevitable because then there's only one rule and that's might makes right. When you believe that everything's just dead materialism, might makes right. There's really no other argument. You have to, in order to believe in any of the higher principles of humanity, really, you can't, in my mind, ascribe to this idea of dead materialism, or you just hit a wall. You hit a ceiling that you can't go beyond. And it's, I think, one of the most horrible things that has ever been wrought upon people. And I will say, to me, it's very Malachian. And, and it's very delightful for Moloch because it means there will be no resistance. And if you look at where transhumanism is going, I mean, what are they offering? They're offering the Borg from, Borg from Star Trek, right? A collective hive mind, total control, a black cube, no less. <laughs> mm-hmm. The black cube yeah. comes up against Saturnian, right? And what do they say? Mm-hmm. What's the most famous Borg phrase? Resistance is futile. It's futile, yeah. If you believe resistance is you believe it, it's true. It's it is if you believe it. If you believe it. And it flows from resistance is futile, flows directly from this idea of there is no divine spark. We're just meat machines that have a short period of time on here and might makes right. You know, and so I'm of the personal belief that uh, dead materialism is the most poisonous evil ideology of all time. And what's even worse is when people begin to take it on as their own identity and they start saying, and I don't mean spiritual atheists out there, but when they start saying, I'm an atheist. and, and, And what they mean by that is I'm a dead materialist, right? Because there is a slight distinction there, although I would say 98% of atheists are dead materialists. When they start taking that on as their own identity, now the poison's deep because now they've identified with the poison and it's almost impossible to get out. I will tell you, I literally just had an argument with someone who is an atheist and they were blackpilling everyone around them. It's an inevitable. There's no stopping the new world order. There's no stopping whatever. And I was like, what are you doing? Why would you be spreading that? You're, you're saying, oh, they're so bad on the one hand, and then you're saying give up before the first proverbial first shot is fired. You know what I mean? They were saying that the U.S. would just be instantly rolled over and everyone would just give up if ever, you know, they used extreme force or whatever. And I was like, oh, if that was true, they would have already done it. And the fact they haven't done it means that the decision centers know that it would not go well if they cross certain red lines in the United States in particular. But if you can get the population to take that black pill, I don't know if you know that term black pilling. Yeah, so there's yeah. red pilling is waking up, right? Well, I'll just say it for the viewers. So red pilling is kind of, um, it's sometimes synonymous with becoming a Republican. And that's not what I'm saying here. I'm talking about red pilling, which means that you start to realize that all the forces of government and corporations are bending you over and, having their way with you. That's, uh, that's what I mean by red pilling. It's sort of awakening to real politic would be another way of, of putting it. Um, then there's white pilling, which means everything's going to work out and da, da, da. And I like to throw white pills out a lot because I actually think it's true. Um, blue pilling is going back to sleep and, oh, I can't wait to vote for Biden again in the fall or whatever, or, or, or uh, Trump's going to save us or Musk is going to save us or whatever partisan bullshit, you know, like, you know, any kind of belief in the power structure is, is blue pilling. It's going back to sleep. Again, it's the matrix, right? Um, black pilling is that you uh, you are have discovered some of the stuff we're talking about and you go, I'm just one man. What can I possibly do against this array of forces against me? It's hopeless. Resistance is futile. And this guy was doing it. And then I started to just wonder, and I, I said, well, are you spiritual at all? Because he was asking, like, what can be done about a lot of these things? And my answer is spiritual in nature. We're do your own shadow work and get yourself really healthy. And then you can do whatever your skill is, international law in your case. Or I have another friend who's a, I just made her acquaintance, who's a, um, a singer, you know, or there's different people who are, uh, you know, esoteric and magicians like me or astrologers like me, or there's... Um, you know, maybe an architect or whatever, or someone who understands how to do permaculture, all the array of human talents can come to bear. But 
they're most effective when you've dealt with your own shadow first. And then there's stuff you can do, in my opinion, on a spiritual level to affect change with the hermetic principles, speaking things into existence and so forth. But um, you, you really have to do that stuff first. And so I said, are you spiritual at all? And he goes, I'm atheist as fuck, bro. And I was like, oh, and I was like, well, and I tried to explain things that I said, just said to you, you know, the universe is mental in nature and all this stuff. And then he was basically saying that because I guess I wasn't willing to take up arms and possibly get a knock on my door from the FBI by stating this publicly on Facebook, I, I wouldn't do that anyway. I have no desire to die <laughs> or be arrested. So I'm not going to do that kind of stuff anyway. But he was basically saying, if you're not taking up arms against Davos, then you're not doing anything. And I'm like, Oh my God, that all of that is just such a defeatist attitude. We all have roles we can play. Like Philip is is working on this international law because there has to be a structure in place when this old order crumbles. And Philip is trying to build that with his international law NGO. So anyway, sorry for the super um, going off the rails thing there, but I just think that it, it it's really dangerous and it's interesting that this emanates from Venice and it makes perfect sense to me because I could smell the Malachian print on dead <clears throat> materialist atheism, but I'd never bothered to really trace it back any further than 1850s Britain, where yeah, they sort of do that. comes out of that because of the Venetian Makes perfect party. sense. Yeah. The what? Sorry? The, the British empiricism. Yeah. It comes out of what you could only know through your, sen your five senses. Right. And that's why they favor the philosophy of Aristotle. You know, ah. because Aristotle makes a always a very strong case for slavery, so he's part of their might makes life. right. If we're just meat machines, that's right? The Jesuit, right? right? The Jesuit, uh, by uh, the ends justify the means, right? Right, you know, and. Yeah, yeah. the Jesuits, are, some people think the Jesuits run the world. They don't know that there are families that run and fund the Jesuits. Right. It's, they can't, because they get emotionally attached to this argument, the Jesuits run the world. They say, well, they say, there's families that started the Jesuits, like the Borgias, and the Massimo family is part owner of the Jesuits. No, 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 the Jesuits are independent. Well, how do you know that? Because I saw that, and I like really like that idea. I've fallen in love with that idea and nothing you can say can move me to any other position because I know this for a fact. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, people want people want Star Wars, right? They want a guy coming in in all black who's like, I will destroy your planet and they want a simple and they want a lightsaber duel to end it. People want this bullshit simple thing and it's like, as we've been discussing this entire show, it's incredibly complicated <laughs> it's really, yeah it is it, it is uh, as you said it, it's a hot mess <laughs> yeah, and I think it really either, is you know people get this image of the you know illuminati and mm -hmm. that it's this pristine kind of uh structure is mm -hmm. uh, you know they know exactly what they're doing mm -hmm. no you go up to the top and it becomes m messier you come up against people who are psychotic who have mm -hmm. God complexes, who are doing all kinds of completely things with we won't go into it in this show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Depraved stuff, people. Absolutely. Like the, the, your worst nightmares and beyond. I mean, if you want to, you can go down those rabbit holes, but we're not doing that here. Yeah. And they've, and they've also, there's a whole uh, level of enforcers mm -hmm. who work uh, in entertainment, who are, you know, in, um, mixed martial arts and who work as enforcers and bodyguards and bodybuilding mm -hmm. and Hollywood. I, um, I'm much work. more susceptible to bribes than forced, by the way, to the uh, black nobility. I'm figuring, you know, low, low oh, nine too, digits yeah. per year, low nine digits yeah, yeah. per year. And I can start uh, saying how great the black nobility is just low nine digits. You guys have infinite wealth. That's nothing to you, you know, just hundred mil a year for life or equivalent in gold as it is right today. I need to be clear on that before hyperinflation. <laughs> well, Russian, in Russian rubles, because now what the Russian ruble is now backed by gold, I hear. Yeah, yeah, it's there's like a, sound, there's sound a, money. some kind of link, there is like some kind of link, uh, 
it's not an official gold standard per se, but it's also like the closest thing the planet's had since uh, Nixon uh, took took the depegged the yeah. dollar. So it's a it's it that is a very interesting turn of events for sure. That actually really seems to undercut um, a lot of this banking stuff and and points to that the, again there seems to be rifts. It's not monolithic. There's clear fractures and it seems like they're appearing more all the time. And people are like, oh, but look at all the horrible stuff that's going on. And Iran is requiring biometric ID to get food and all that stuff. And I see that stuff and it's scary. And there's two ways to look at it. It's like, it's either, you're either looking at uh, this monolithic thing, like it seems, you know, which is the scary blackpilling version or something that I think is very likely to me is rulers tend to like things that increase their power. And if they see a good idea that another ruler is doing it and they think, huh, that would help give me greater control of my population. I too will adopt that. Doesn't mean they're all working for the same side even if they're using similar techniques and, and, and so forth, even though we are pointing to towards something that is virtually monolithic uh, in, in a certain sense, as in the, the con- level of concentration of power and wealth among the families that Philip and I are talking about is quite literally unimaginable. I mean, they literally have infinite wealth in a certain sense because they control the uh, money printing press as well. Digital. Yeah, there's money. one. Well, it's more than that. They control it ultimately... As I see it, uh, the control of natural resources is the most important thing. If you control natural resources, then you can delegate people to print the money. Right. Uh, But one source I saw and said, he said, you know, we think of Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. He said he said he personally has seen a single bank, bank statement from the Krupps family in Germany on one bank account on one day. And it was like 110 trillion dollars and he said you know that's the kind of money people like bill gates they are they can't even they dream about it but they they're just they're absolutely nothing these people mm-hmm. are nothing right and 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 that's a great point it goes back to that jp morgan thing in the earlier part of the show like the mm-hmm. any name billionaire that you're familiar with is uh, just uh they're, they're just a front man for much deeper much older money yeah it's the if, if you see them in public they're nobody. Yeah, it seems like some of these uh, noble families basically never leave their estates, it seems like, probably for security reasons. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. Like, it seems There's... like they leave it for me- certain meetings and for, like, funerals in particular and sometimes weddings. But, like, they, they don't seem to – a lot of them, it seems, don't leave Italy ever. <laughs> At least I couldn't find any information that pointed towards that. More like people come to them. Some of them are kind of, you know, globetrotters. And, you know, certainly Carl is always traveling for more serious uh, purposes. I, I mean, kind of like the, the nastier families seem like they kind of stay in their Yeah, I think castles. the head of the Massimo family, I, I heard that he's gotten extremely paranoid. Mm-hmm. Probably with good reason. I don't know. He, I don't know. He could be. Think about this. There could be a schism within a single individual. Mm. Someone very powerful has warring properties, qualities in the, within themselves. Yeah, that's that's it. That's very interesting thought. I mean, I think we all have that. The classic devil and angel on the so- shoulders kind of thing. You know, right. and 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 I don't like to. I also just don't like to think about people being completely, completely, completely lost. I do think the reality is, is that that's de facto true, meaning that there are people that are just so far gone, whether they're possessed by literal demons, like, you know, some kind of what we would call evil spirits or um, whether they're just the, the sheer weight, psychological weight of their actions over the course of their life has driven them completely insane you know, um, yeah, it could be situational, you know, mm-hmm. from, like from what I know, Trump, I think uh, people said his boss, Trump's boss is Prince Rofredo Gaetani. Hmm. And Prince, the Gaetani's pay tribute to the Massimos. Hmm. So it could be, and that in order to stay in that game, in order to survive at that level of power, growing up around such dark forces, you have to be 
you have to be ruthless. You have to be a scrapper. You have to be a demon almost, or you'll get eliminated. Mm -hmm. And you may be on top, but you may be always looking over your shoulder. Absolutely. And so you can't. It's so easy to pass uh, judgment on people. And mm -hmm. it's the fastest thing people want to do. Or if I can quickly pass judgment on this, then I can pretend I understand it. Yeah. You know, but of course, uh, you know, we don't. If, you, if you're hoping to understand more, you can't get off there. You have to keep going. Right. And. And so, um, Philip, I know that you're probably uh, needing to go to your appointment here shortly. Is that right? Um, yeah, yeah, fairly, fairly soon. Did you want to talk about the Guelphs and the Ghibellines just very quickly? Oh, yeah. So, so we'll touch on this. And this is going to be um, Philip and I will eventually do, and it'll be mostly Philip um, are going to do a, a, a deeper show on this specific thing. This is literally what we're going to talk about. And then we, um, you know, one of the things I love about these conversational series is they are conversations. And just like in real life, I always derail them and, and go off on tangents. <laughs> no, I mean, like, conversations just tend to do that with anybody, but I'm ex extremely bad in that regard. And so, Philip, yeah, please. No, no, it's, you, this has to, this, this subject is so new and it's so complicated. I think the only way to go at it is an organic, informal way and then gradually mm -hmm. shaping what we do know. When I have seen presentations that attempt to give you, okay, in a formulaic way, this is how it is, I often, I, you should be very suspicious of anybody who tells you they have it all figured That's out. That's a good point. That's a great point, Philip, and thank you for saying that. I, I agree with you. I, I And I definitely, let me be clear, I, I feel like I have a better map than most, but my map is far from complete and has probably has many inaccuracies. And, you know, along with that uh, nine-figure uh, a year uh, stipend that they're going to give me, they can maybe let me in on what's really going on. <laughs> when they yeah. clearly reach yeah. out to me with a giant Bitcoin donation or whatever. <laughs> hey, it just might happen. <laughs> Go ahead. And, right tell them, this tell them that about, the, about one of the oldest visible schisms in uh, the various Black nobility uh, papal bloodlines. Well, um, and we'll go I into this in more depth later, uh, people. But yeah, uh, oh, Philip will absolutely talk because about it. I just came across. I, you know, I'm I am not an expert in this at all. Mm -hmm. But what you know, I just discovered this. I wondered. I heard about the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. This was in the uh, 11th and 12th centuries. This mm -hmm. contest, and it was almost like what we see today: cultural war, culture war between. New World Order, so-called corporate leftists, as I call them, and then, uh, you know, the other side represented by perhaps conservatism, Putin, self-determination, sovereignty. Right? Nationalism, yeah. Yes, and rule of law, but in the best tradition. And mm -hmm. you saw this happening back then. The Guelphs were pro-papacy. They wanted, they were favoring the uh, power of the Pope. This was the contest where you had you know, where the, the Holy Roman Emperor would appoint the Pope, the Pope, Pope would crown the Emperor, and you never knew who really had the upper hand, and it was a bit messy. The Ghibellines were represented those who supported the power of the Holy Roman Emperors. And this played out most intensely uh, in Northern Italy, in the Lombard region, you had many competing city-states Mm -hmm. And it looks like what we're seeing today, the the Guelphs, as we know, the Guelph out of the, that comes out of uh, the Sax uh, Go, Gota comes out of the Guelphs hmm. and the Vetten family, uh, hmm. but Sax Coburg Gota comes out of the Guelph family. The Queen hmm. Elizabeth is a Guelph, so the Guelphs were pro papacy. That was usually associated with the larger, more successful, wealthy city states, and they, they of course, didn't want the emperor, the power of the emperor, the oversight of the emperor, to interfere with their ability to make money. Mm. Then you had the smaller towns and more and agricultural areas who favored the Holy Roman Emperor, and it was literally all very, very analogous to what we're seeing today with 
in, in terms of the culture wars. Mm. And it got down to where, like, uh, it, you, you know, if you were a Guelph or a Ghibelline, you would put the, you the feather of your hat on one side or the other. And it, it also, it, it, how you cut certain fruit would be according to whether you were a Guelph or a Ghibelline. And it became kind of like this insanity, this patchwork of so incredibly complex, but along these basic lines that we see today. Hmm. So there could be, uh, I think, a schism there with, you know, someone like the Habsburgs, obviously, with the Holy Roman Empire, and then the Guelphs representing a different mindset that we're seeing with predatory banking and uh, all kinds of, um, you know, what would you call it, demonic license to, de to deny uh, natural law and do as thou wilt, or, you know, that kind of very dark, which you, you, you've elaborated on this, but basically I saw definitely a mirror image between those two groups, but I have to, I just, dis I just discovered, I just discovered this the other day and I was yeah. shocked to see how, how closely it resembled what we're dealing with today. That's fascinating. And just uh, to, and we'll, we'll end here shortly, but, um, it reminds me of this uh, theory that I talked about with uh, another guest, Grant Eagles, um, uh, about this uh, sort of Malachian system being the Great Reset and Klaus Schwab and the Borg hive mind eat bugs and own nothing crap, you know, uh, and that being, I also talked about it with Sammy Richard, that Sammy just said that, that, that he sees that site as being dumber that they that they're really not creative, but they're just very ruthless and oppressive. And that in contrast to that, there's more of this Luciferian or Promethean, um, you know, and uh, for viewers who, who haven't watched me before, like there's a huge, huge difference between Lucifer and Moloch. Christians are gonna hear it as all the same thing. It's all the devil, you know, and blah, blah, blah. But that is just straight up not accurate in in like at all if you understand esotericism and the, the varying deities that are out there but the promethean or luciferian is more liberty minded um it, it's not necessarily good it still has a very ruthless element to it um it's not you know it's not like the most high the angelic spheres but um lucifer actually is an angel or was an angel and it has more of a um focus on personal liberty and uh development and knowledge and spiritualizing humanity and free will. moving away from matter and free will very much free will it's funny because lucifer's original argument is he didn't think humans were better and then weirdly because angels normally don't have this somehow exercise free will and moved out of the angelic current of being um they don't have free will they they have sentience but they don't have free will they're just always in um harmony with the most high but anyways the Luciferian or Promethean principle, you know, Prometheus is who gave man fire and stole it from the gods and gave it to, to humans. And likewise, Lucifer is very like uh, uh, pro-technology, but um, technology that's more liberating. So like maybe space travel or anti-gravity or free energy, things that would be liberating and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. allowing more motion and, and so forth. And the Malachian version of technology is very clamping down, control, Borg, hive mind, da da da. Yeah, it's oppressive, it, and, it, it, and it destroys your creative faculties. Exactly, it, 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 blunts, it blunts your your talents and your your native kind of uh, qualities. The, Absolutely, the best and highest qualities. I, I totally yeah. agree. That's exactly right, and it's funny because that Gulfs and Gillibeans thing sounds like that. And you see that um, you see that cycle, especially over the past um, thousand years or so. You know, we're now coming to the end of a nearly six thousand period of Kali Yuga, and so there's a force since we're in the, in the ascending Kali Yuga. There's a force that's moving against um, this clamping down, very dead materialist, very divisive, uh, dualistic, um, slavery, chaotic uh, thing. There, there's this move towards harmony and towards um, liberation really from this. And, uh, and that is a stage of development within that cycle as you go towards the golden age where the most high rules, whose name has been lost, uh, 
you go from this Malachian or satanic, some people would call it era of the iron age of the Kali Yugas into uh, the bronze and silver ages, which I've been told front by spirit is run by Lucifer, that that is the God of that, of that ascending bronze and silver age. And then it reaches a point to where there's just total harmony. And it's no longer that Luciferian. It's just total compassion and total harmony and total everyone working together just effortlessly without any question. There's probably some element of like um, telepathy to it and, and just sense of like shared unity consciousness. That's, these are the myths that have come down from us from the last golden age, which would have been what's commonly referred to as Atlantis or the empire of Rama may be the same thing. I'm not hundred percent on that, but it seems like it from the approximate time. And that would have been during the last ice age about um, 13,500 years ago, something like that. And uh, would have started much earlier. That's when it ended was with the younger driest comet impact seems to be when that ended. Um, and then there was a fall in consciousness. And so um, there does seem to be this, and it's been ramping up over time that there's this desire. I think there's a desire for freedom, which is expressed to a certain extent by the internet, right? Like Philip and I can have this conversation about um, with a desire at least for helping liberate humanity. That's a part of our goal here with this conversation. I think it's safe to say, and that's pushing against this censorship and thought policing and nonsense kind of thing. You know, Philip and I talked about very contentious stuff. And by the way, viewer, if you got this far, like, you know, <laughs> high five. Cause like, um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's been a long one here. I might split this into two halves. We'll see. Um, but yeah, uh, this desire for something more and for harmony and and that is a, a promethean desire or, or luciferian and i know that's a trigger word for a lot of christians but it's just uh you know well you're kind mean, of saying of that you're kind of saying maybe if i if i interpret it please maybe lucifer has been co-opted by by satanists um, it's been more like used as a spiritual version of the Khazarian Mafia. It's a layer. And actually, Lucifer, my understanding is what angels have told me and so forth is that Lucifer and all deities have no choice but to kiss the ring of Moloch when Moloch runs. And that because Lucifer is this hyper intellect, Lucifer is this hyper, hyper intellect. I mean, it's just super intellectual that... Um, uh, that, that that being has had to even had no choice but to serve Moloch. And that's part of what confuses people. And that Lucifer is all the creative stuff that's ever come from the Malachian running things has come from this Luciferian impulse or this I spirit see, yeah, of yeah, Lucifer. Yeah. And so like in Venice, um, you know, I, I had wanted to talk about this at the beginning, when they, a lot of people think Henry Ford invented the assembly line. Not so. It may have even been, it's probably invented. Everything seems to have been invented in China first, but um, uh, the Venetians would be able to just roll out warships at just this incredible speed. And of course, the Phoenicians were great shipbuilders before they moved to Venice, uh, Rome and Venice. But uh, the Venetians had a model to where they could put out they'd be making separate parts of it an assembly line all at once to where they could crank out an entire giant ass warship every day. Yeah. Every day one would yeah. roll out the docks or even multiples. I forget what the numbers were. It was, it was staggering when you consider the scale of these ships and the complexity and they, part of the reason they became so wealthy is their ships were so good, but that's very much like, that's a Luciferian thing. That's not a Malachian thing. The mechanical thing you can say, or the war aspect you can say, although Lucifer's not opposed to war. I, I do want to be clear on that. Lucifer is not some gentle, well, friendly deity. It just looks it's fantastic. Sorry, go ahead. What? Yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes actions have to be taken. You know? Yeah. Uh, the the, the Malachian aspect, it could be, you know, what I did, what we didn't get into the show because it's so overwhelming and it's so dark. Mm -hmm. uh, it's tremendous, the, you know, uh, the kind of terror, fear, brutal, brute force, intimidation, bullying, gang stalking, oppressive, oppression using electronic uh, weaponry and, mm -hmm. and spells through the media and disinformation and, and fear. 
it's so powerful. And as I think I said in, in our last show, can basically we we must produce vibrations that are higher than that is low. Yes. And that's really tough because it is so low. It's so low. I'll do more research. I'll see if I can corroborate some of this and we'll talk about it, how much we want to get into. But mm -hmm. we need to keep the what we know, what you know and I know, but we mm -hmm. haven't said it explicitly. We have to be that much higher to overcome because it's so powerful. It's powerful. It is. And, and the best way to do that, viewer, and I think this is a good note to end on, is um, uh, if you watch that interview I did with Sammy Richard just recently, um, really the key is, is that when we look out there, we see the collective shadow of humanity, which you can see the epicenter is some of these Malachian Black nobility families, it's especially specific members, right? Um, but that is only possible because so many other people have been infected with that lower vibration, that fear and that darkness. And then very often they push it away. Like one of the things I can't stand is this, everything is love and light, love and light. Let's not, Oh, don't talk about bad stuff. Blah, blah, blah. You can't do that. Yeah. Of course we want things to go to everything is love and life, but you don't just hop there. You don't just, it's like that one meme where the kid is stepping up like five stairs, like that middle section is like shadow work and stuff. You don't get to that stage of, some people do, but it's exceedingly rare for someone to just suddenly become awakened, like say an Eckhart Tolle or whoever. Most people have to go through this intense period of dissolving ego and shadow. And how you do that is by confronting your own shadow. And so when you see that shadow out in the world and you want it to change, again, it's huge. It's too big for any one person to do, but there is something you can do, and that's to work on your own shadow. And that's what I've been doing, especially these last five months, extremely uh, intentionally and intensely working through all the ways that I've failed as a human being, you know, uh, in given instance, I'm, I'm not a failure, but I have failed at times, you know, um, I mentioned in the last one that, you know, uh, I, I used to have a, a really bad addiction to pornography and I used to have a lot of shame about it to where I certainly wouldn't talk about it in a public forum. And the reason I'm talking about it now is, is, not because I either want people to think I'm, I'm a creep or a weirdo, and if they do, that's too bad, but rather for, for people to recognize, you know what, I drink too much alcohol, but I need to look at that and be honest with myself. Wow, I drink too much alcohol, or I smoke too much weed. I used to, I used to smoke too much weed, um, or I'm addicted to pornography, or I'm a sex addict, or I'm verbally abusive to my child, or I'm physically abusive to my child or my wife or husband or whatever. And you have to, you know, the first step is you have to admit that you're doing that thing and you got to look at it. And then the next step is you have to start working with those energies and start really honestly, like going, what's at the root of this and, and, and feeling them, feeling those suppressed feelings, that psychological material. You know, Jung talked about this a ton. And as you do that and you start to work through it, you start to emanate more and more of this lighter energy. And the work you then do in the world carries that energy with it. Because if you go out and do work in the world and you have all the suppressed shadow, whether even if you have the noblest of intentions, the work you're doing in the world, the food you're making, whatever it is that you're doing, it's going to have the vibration of your energy signature to it. And if you have that suppressed darkness that goes out into the world and what you do, conversely, if you have worked through more and more and more stuff, what you put out in the world just has that energy and it's infectious. It's infectious in the same way that blackpilling stuff can push someone who's teetering and maybe slightly depressed into super monopolar depression or suicidal ideation or whatever. Likewise, if you give people this positive energy, they might be teetering and then they, they're like, oh my God, that was what I needed. And, and I suddenly have the strength to do my own work. And then it cascades and it expands. And the hope is that eventually, you know, along with my uh, lower nine figure stipend, I'm going to be getting, um, you know, some of these black nobility people can, um, you know, hopefully have that breakthrough and then they can affect change because ultimately wouldn't the best way for things to change quickly would be if the very people the show is about 
suddenly had that kind of spiritual awakening and were like, oh my God, what have I done? What has my family done? And I'm going to be honest about it. And I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to start making changes. And I'm going to confront that shadow within my family. And I'm not going to go immediately to my psychotic uncle who runs the world's mafias, but I'm going to talk to my cousin who's a little more reasonable and maybe start to influence him. And then maybe he can go to his dad and his dad loves his son. And then that's what causes Darth Vader to go, you know, oh my God, I need to turn against the emperor and fucking help Luke out, you know, or whatever, you know, I mean, it's all metaphors, but it really is how we change the world is by doing that. It, it's a cliche, but it, it, doing that change within ourselves first really does reflect out in the world. And I can say that from my own personal experience that it's, it's very tangible and real. And my life has yeah, improved yeah. and the lives of everyone I interact with have improved because I'm less depressed. I'm less angry. I'm less all those things. And they start to lift up a little bit and it's infectious. It really is. So yeah. Philip, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, we'll do more on this because as we both discovered, this is a, a deep one. We're also going to, um, I'm going to bring Philip back because Philip is a lawyer. Um, he no, not, I'm not a lawyer. You're I, not I, even I, a lawyer? No, no, I have, I, I love, the, I'm, a, I'm a law aficionado and I have lawyers that work with me. Ah, okay. And I, I have an idea. I'm like, do I you think we can do this? Do you think this is, and they're like, hmm, yes. And I go, okay, especially, uh, yeah, I mean, people that I've known my whole life. So, fantastic. yeah, okay. I, trained, I, I trained as an actor. Oh, that's right. You said and that, at yeah. At some point, I said, I want, I, that's not good enough for and me. Your, and your father's stuff. a lawyer, though, is that right? Yes. And he's even a law yeah, professor. Yeah. Okay. And okay. So, so that's how coming. I got that wire crossed. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Philip and I are going to talk about, um, in the a future episode, we want to talk about um, admiralty or maritime law, uh, which is its own <laughs> incredibly deep can of worms. And so we will, um, we'll, we'll also be talking about that, but we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about this. I would like to do um, more in depth on the um, the Gulfs and the Gillibeans, can you the say Gulfs and the Gillibeans, and also, and the Gillibeans. We, you know, we'll talk about all this other material I found as well as you know, uh, psychotronic terrorism, and I just oh. printed this out. Oh my! Uh, and how how the whole issue of of uh, privacy is actually concealing the fact that they are absolutely able to uh, impinge upon our consciousness with different devices. That's you know, I just was right. reading about how I want to say it's Bolivia or some country like some South American country is. Um, uh, trying to come up with rights to your own mind which yeah. is wild. And they also like are um, saying that they don't want to, um, they don't want to, um, what do you call it? Uh, discriminate against people who are, 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 are um, genetically modified, which is, <laughs> is creepy. But you know what? I, I think that, um, I think they already exist. And I don't just mean someone who has a chip to open their garage door either. I mean, I think there's people who are heavily genetically modified and uh, chimeric. And I think that actually, Old ex-president W. Bush tried to warn us about this about almost 20 years ago and was roundly mocked by the media. But I saw the, the fear in that man's eyes and I knew he had seen something horrible, horrible in an underground military lab and was trying to warn us. And uh, yeah, so like, yeah, we can we can talk about that. The Syrian, so, yeah. yeah, sorry that the, I saw the, the Syrian ambassador to the UN, he got up and he was very agitated and he said, they are sending genetically modified soldiers into our country. Wow. This was about three years ago. Yeah. Well, remember there was that movie, uh, Universal Soldier in the 90s, that was about uh, genetically modified super soldiers, which then makes one think that they had them for a bit before that. So, yeah. yeah. So anyways, yeah. Um, Philip, Philip will uh, be a regular on the show. We might even have um, like a sort of offshoot show that me and Philip do together. Um, I'm trying to do cl collaboration with a few people, not just repeat guests, but people where I'm doing deeper collaboration. And, and Philip is definitely one of those. And so um, thank you so much for your time, Philip. And uh, I always do this. I always remember at the absolute end, Anyone who made it this far, I should really be subscribing to you, but if you could hit the like and subscribe button 
I always put it down below in a little trailer because I always forget. But thank you so much, viewer, for watching it. And if you got this far, um, seriously, like I should be uh, paying you, actually. <laughs> so thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I just, I just want to thank, I just want to thank you for everything you're doing, for your oh, presence you. that you're putting out there. Such high level stuff. It's very intimidating sometimes to watch some of you, the guests you have. They're so on point, you know. Wow, thank you. <laughs> I feel so, I feel enriched and en enlightened when I watch your material, when I interact with you in any way, and I feel very privileged. Oh. And it's always great wow, to see you. Thank you, you. Philip. That's really, uh, that's, uh, that's really humbling. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, viewer. And um, we'll go ahead and end it there. Bye.